actually, it's like a minute after that time. Welcome, good evening. And before I get started, I do want to say, happy Coast Guard Day. Coast Guard Day. August 4th, 1790, the Revenue Cutter Service was put into place, precursor to the Coast Guard, 231 years ago. I'm mentioning that for our resident Coastie and civilian Coast Guard employee in the back. Plus, there are less than 12,300,000 seconds to Christmas, so I'm building up points. <laughs> it all works. But seriously, it is Coast Guard Day today. So, happy Coast Guard Day. Um, we will be in Isaiah 64. Actually, you don't even have to turn that. It's on the front of your bulletin. We're gonna, that's going to be our jumping off point. And if you notice the title, you should see what Gumby can do today. There's a reason behind that. I'm going to read Isaiah 64, 8. It says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art thou our potter, and we're all the work of thy hand. Again, so we're going to be talking about God the potter tonight and how we are his clay, being molded in his hands. Now, if you've ever made pottery, you understand it's a messy endeavor to do anything with clay. Your hands become very, very dirty as the wet clay takes its place. But think of the picture of God with his hands on us, molding us, shaping us. He doesn't mind getting his hands dirty like that to make us into what he wants. He wants to be involved in our lives. Think God the Son, Jesus, stepping down out of heaven to walk on earth, to take the place our sin upon himself, getting dirty for us, and how he still works, how the Holy Spirit still works in and around us. Again, getting their hands dirty. I've only ever done anything with clay or pottery once. My middle school art class, I think it was eighth grade we probably did it. School got a brand new kiln, and they thought it would be a good idea to have a bunch of 13 and 14 year olds working with clay, making pottery. I think I tried to make a mug. I only say I think I tried because I'm pretty sure it didn't come out. But think of the mess a bunch of 13 and 14 year olds made with clay. And you get the picture of just what a mess it can be. Again, think of Christ though. Think of God working, shaping that clay. It's certainly not gonna come out like the mug that I tried to make. I think the best thing that came out was one of my friends made like a plate or a little saucer. That came out. He cheated, it was just the flat, but anyway. You see what it takes to work with clay, to make something beautiful out of it. Think about God working and just the beauty that he can work. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. We thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you that you are the potter and that you are working us, molding us, shaping us to be what you would have us to be. I just pray that we would submit as clay should to the potter, submit to what you would have and allow you to work your beauty in us. Can we thank you and pray this in your son Jesus' name, amen. When you think about something homemade, my grandmother used to put things on there, homemade with love or handmade with love. She was very crafty. I mean that in a good way. She was very good at crafts, arts and crafts, things of that nature. But she would always put something like that on it. And God, he crafts us. We are made with his love. And he's the potter. He's sovereign over his clay. The potter can also be trusted because he is good and he does good. We know this from Psalm 119, 67 and 68. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Again, we know God is good and he does good. His hands are where the ordinary becomes extraordinary. And we are his extraordinary work because of him. Life can feel like a lump of clay, hence the title. How many of you remember or know the Gumby theme? Gumby, Gumby. yeah, the Gumby theme. I knew you would know it. Did you say theme? Yeah, the theme, the old to the TV show, the old cartoon. 
Gumby had a theme. He was once a little green slab of clay. You should see what Gumby can do today. Now there is more, but this is what's applicable to us tonight, so we're gonna stop right there. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you wouldn't know, because I was really trying to get you that time. Gumby, a little slab of clay. Remember, life can feel like it's just a lump of clay, like we're not doing anything, like we have no purpose, like we are just this lump, this slab just sitting there waiting to do something. Sometimes we find ourselves just unable to see beyond what's right in front of us, whether it's the trial in front of us, the difficulty, whatever it may be, or just everyday life in front of us. Sometimes we don't see beyond that and what God has. We feel sometimes directionless, sometimes hopeless. We feel like we're just spinning around in circles, living life day to day, doing what we need to do. Well, there's hope though, because there is a potter. And no, I'm not talking about Harry or Colonel Sherman Potter. There is God, the potter. His hands are in our lives. He's the one that shapes us. He molds us, brings us, uh, brings meaning and purpose to our life. He is sovereign over us. He can be trusted, again, because he is good and does good. He waits for us to place ourselves in his hands. We need to do that. The thought of someone taking time, using their skills to craft an object with their own hands makes it more special. Again, anything grandma made was always more special because we knew she took her time, her talents, thinking of us the whole time, making it, makes it more special. Think of those of you who had kids when they would bring home that special art that you had to hang on the refrigerator. Many of you did it because you knew they made that themselves. It was theirs. Again, I am no artist. My mom still hung my little stick figures with like one arm longer than the other and you know. <laughs> she still liked and still displayed it. I was always her special son. Not sure what that meant, but I was. But again, when somebody takes time to make something, to create it, it's more precious. I think God who created us, takes the time in our lives to, create, to shape us, make us what he wants. Value is not just found in the object or the material from which it is made. And its value is based on the creator. How many of you are fans of abstract art? I actually like some. I like some of it. I can look at it. I mean, went through the Art Institute in Chicago, and they have some very interesting abstract art out there. I liked looking at it. But what's the difference between Jackson Pollock taking paint and throwing it on a canvas, or me taking paint and throwing it against a canvas? He gets paid for it. Yeah, he gets paid for it. He gets paid a lot. I get told, clean up that mess, <laughs> because there just wasn't value in my name. The thing is, with Jackson Pollock, with Da Vinci, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, any of these people, Seriously, it's paint on canvas. I can do paint on canvas, but the name that's attached means many want it, but few can afford it. Mine, many can afford it, few want it, because the name that is attached to it. Again, the uniqueness is in the creator. The uniqueness, the value in us is in God and what he does with us, how he creates, shapes, and molds us, what he makes of us. So the scene is said of us, we are masterpieces, not that we are more valued or better than others, but because of the one who made us, the one who shapes us. There's our value. It's what makes us the masterpiece. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Can you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, please? It's a very familiar passage. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to start at verse 8. Like I said, very familiar. Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Look at verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Again, the value is in who created us. Who is the creator? Who is the sculptor? That's where it lies. I want to look at our creator, the potter. See in Genesis chapter 1, the name Elohim used. He is God. But I want to look at another name that we actually see in chapter 2. Genesis 2, 4. There are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. And they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. We have discussed before, just a little refresher, why Lord is spelled in all capitals instead of capital L, small, O-R-D. We're first to the personal name of God. The personal name translates Yahweh. We translate it into English. The name he gives Moses at the burning bush. It's the name that he should say sent him. This is who he is. Exodus 3.14 says, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. It's God's name of relationship. The relationship he's going to have with people. It's literally translated, I am. Nothing more. They would know this. They would know who he was referring to. Jehovah. Yahweh. It's a holy name that the Israelites took care of when writing it or saying it. In fact, scribes would purify themselves just to write the name. They would use an, pick up an unused writing implement, implement whether be parchment, when they're writing on the parchment, when they're using the quills, whatever it may be, they would use a new one, never touched before, to write his name. That's the reverence they have. In fact, they remove the vowels. If you've ever seen Hebrew writing, they use vowel points. They take it out so it's just Y-H-W-H reverence they have for the name. They will not use it Again, because it's his personal name, the name Moses was given. So chapter 1 of Genesis might give, well, does give, the seven days of creation, but chapter 2 is all about God setting up the relationship, setting it into motion, setting the stage for his relationship with man. He's not only our creator, but he desires to have a restored relationship with us. We see it start. Again, back to Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter. We are all, we all are the work of thy hand. Can you turn with me to Jeremiah 18, please. Read Jeremiah 18, verses 3 through 6. I'm going to start back at verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my, my hand, O house of Israel. And Romans 9, 20 to 21 says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, another unto dishonor. Again, we see clay in the potter's hands, so were we molded, sculpted by God. We're in his hand. We are his. God, is, as the potter, is both sovereign and trustworthy. Again, it's easier, and many people, especially today, like to look at God as just the loving father, the good shepherd. They just want to see him as all love, nothing else. But it's important that we see him as having control over the clay. Like a potter, the clay has no say in what it's going to become, what it's going to do. It allows the potter to make it, 
to work it. Sometimes, if needed, if you've ever seen a potter, something doesn't come out right, they take it and just crush it down and build it up again. Sound familiar? And it's important we understand the characters of God. You can't have one without the other. His love, but also his sovereignty and who he is. We have to understand his complete, sovereign, righteous, his just and holy side. It's who he is as the potter in addition to his tenderness, patience, and enduring love. They go hand in hand. You should always remember, God loves us. We can trust him, but he's also in control. He is king, and rightfully so. We have to allow him. He's righteous, he's holy, he always does what is right and good. Okay, we know this, but sometimes, you ever feel yourself just kinda trying to work your way out, shape yourself as you want? There's no hatefulness in him. There's no wrong in him. His faithfulness can be trusted. We need to let him do his work. 1 John 1, 5 tells us he is light. There's no darkness in him. We can trust in him. In Psalm 119, 68, he, he is good and does good because he is sovereign. We need to trust and let him be the king that he is. He's always in control. We've talked about this before. No matter what life throws at us, it never takes him by surprise. God always knows. He has never once been taken by surprise by something. We, on the other hand, often. You know me, if there's a snake, it takes me by surprise. These things, <laughs> they just happens. But God also cares. He adores. He has an everlasting love for us. Think about that. An everlasting love. And we hear the word love thrown around often. Many people, especially through high school, kids are in love every other day, sometimes with somebody new. They don't understand what love is, but God has an everlasting love for us, something that will never change, someone, something for someone who has to be in charge, trustworthy, to be able to have everlasting love. Something altogether different is his love for us than our love for others. He gave us life. He loves us everlasting. It's an amazing thought to think about something that is everlasting. His love is why he cannot let us perish, why he paid the price for our sin. It was out of love, the love for us. It's why we're safe as clay, why we're safe to surrender to his hands. We may not want to. We may not feel like surrendering. We may want to push back. We are safest in his hands. Again, we are far safer in the will of God than outside, no matter where he may send us, no matter what he may ask us to do, we are far safer in his will, in his hands, mm -hmm. than we are out on our own. And his grace, his mercy are there. Even if we don't understand it, we need to be in his will. We need to be in his hands, Again, whether we know it or not. We'll look at the clay for a moment. Second Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels the excellency of the power of God and not of us. You ever think the illustration of us as earthen vessels? It's kind of fascinating. Think about it. Clay comes from the ground. If you've ever dug anywhere in this area, you're going to hit clay at some point. Marl, to be specific, hence Marlton. There is clay all around here especially around the creeks, etc. But clay comes from the earth. So did man. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man the dust of the ground, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Like clay, we are formed out of the ground. Again, we take clay out of the ground, form it, shape it. God took man out of the dust of the earth, formed us, shaped us. Now, I did learn this during the Bible study that there are different types of clay. I knew there were different types, but I never knew how different some of them were. And comparing a couple can make, give us insights. The two most common types of clay are earthenware and kaolin, or china clay. I may be saying that one wrong. I never knew they were the two most popular or the two most common. The basic differences of them are how far from the original source have they traveled, how many foreign components they contain, 
and the temperature of heat they can endure. Again, I never knew this. Earthenware, or common clay, develops after being transported the farthest from its source, picking up the most impurities, and it melts at a lower temperature. Kaolin is found in form closest to its source, less impurities, and capable of melting at a much higher temperature. It withstands heat far better than earthenware does. You're saying, what does this have to do with anything? I'm about to tell you. <laughs> earthenware is very fragile. It points to us. Our strength does not come from within. It does not come from who we are. Our strength comes from God. Everyday life can get pretty hot at times. Earthenware won't stand up to it. Earthenware will melt, will shatter because of the impurities. People can break down when they're not with God, when they get away from God and allow impurities, when they allow sin to keep filtering in. Unlike the china clay that stays close to its source, that has less impurities, can withstand heat better. The story here is not clay, or not about the clay, but what the potter creates it to be. God doesn't want us to remain a lump of clay. He wants us to place our lives in his hands, to stay close to him, to get rid of the impurities. That way, when the heat starts to turn up in life, he's there with us. He is our strength, unlike the earthenware. He will strengthen us to get through whatever we need, as long as we stay close to him, remaining in his sights. If you're still in Jeremiah, look again at chapter 18. I'll read verses 3 and 4 again. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. It seemed good to the potter to make it. For clay vessels, for, a, for clay to become a vessel of use, it goes through a process. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It doesn't happen in the blink of an eye. Think of our lives. We're a work in progress. We're constantly being shaped. We're constantly being molded, tried, tested, sometimes put to the fire. And over time, we mold into the shape that we're to be. Again, same with clay. Clay being placed in God's hands continues to be shaped, to be moved, to be molded. Same with our salvation. Again, the journey doesn't end with salvation. It merely begins there. That is where, as we continue to walk with him, we begin to be, get molded. God brings us out of a lump of clay, and we start seeing a shape, a form. But it's over time. We're continually working and allowing God to work in us. And he places us on the wheel, moving us, shaping us, begins the process to deliver us from nothingness into a vessel of use. As I said before, as the verse said, it's not to the potter's liking. He'll break it down and start it up again to get it to a vessel he's designed it to be, for us to be what he would have us to be. Billy Graham said this, when we come to the end of ourselves, we come to the beginning of God. Put off self. Let God, at his beginning, build us up. The process with God the potter, one, preparing the clay, getting it ready. And the whole process begins with, well, having the clay, getting it together, adding water, which I didn't know the process is called wedging, consists of kneading the clay, kneading the clay with a K, to remove any bubbles while causing the clay to become less sticky. I think that was my problem. My clay was always too sticky. <laughs> our spiritual life begins with living water, with Christ coming into our lives. As he enters in, wedging begins. It fills in the empty spaces. Christ fills them all while causing us to no longer cling to or stick to the world as we knew it. Not holding on to what was in the past, but letting Christ fill those gaps that we try to fill with whatever else it may be that we try to fill them with. Second is shaping. 
Many believe that God is this far off cosmic being that can never be reached. He's vague, he's untouchable. We can never know him truly. I mean, how do you know God? But we see through God the potter, it's not so. He never takes his hands away from the clay. His hands are always on us, always working with us. Whether a potter uses a hand building or a wheel, his hands remain on the clay. Any of you, have you ever made clay with a wheel or want to try? I suggest take your hands off and just let the wheel go, see what happens. Just a thought. God's hands never leave us, never takes them off of us. We yield ourselves to being placed in the center of the wheel, in the center of God's will. He's able to pull us, to stretch us, to mold us how he would, but also to protect us. And when need be, purge us of anything that shouldn't be there. His hands are always there to do that. That stretching, all that pressure, everything being placed on the clay leads to something beautiful in the end. Again, think of the pressure on coal to make a diamond. Pressure on clay to create a vessel worthy. Third is the firing. Firing brings out maturity in clay. Causes it to endure, to last. In some cases, thousands of years. Every so often you hear where somewhere in the Far East or Middle East, they're finding, finding clay artifacts that have stood thousands of years. And firing changes clay on a molecular level. Transforms it from being soft and pliable to being sturdy, strong, and durable. Again, you don't want to put a liquid into a clay cup or a clay bowl until it's been fired. Think of what happens if you put water on clay. You have more mud. But it also takes two, fire, two phases of firing, bisque firing and glaze firing. Once the piece is fired, though, there is no going back. I mean, once you make it, your only hope then is just to smash it on the ground because it's fired, it's done, it's set where it is. But again, we're not that. We are still being shaped by God. In the same way we receive the Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ, we are also transformed into a new creation, but we're not finished. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5.17 we're sealed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we can't go back. You can't lose that. You can't lose that seal of the Holy Spirit. But we're still pliable in the God's hands that he can still mold us and shape us and move us. Glaze firing adds the second layer of strength and durability. And when we seem like we're going through tough, difficult times, they have purpose. It's to make us stronger. Again, to allow us, we stay close to God, like the china clay, we remain strong in his hands. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And we will stand up to the test with God. We go on our own, that's where we break apart, that's where we begin to falter. And the final step is the finishing. It consists of adding glazes, adding paints, where the color begins, where you start to take your true form as the vessel God would have you to be. Now, any artist would tell you there are limit, limitless combinations of color, design, glazes. And again, like Jackson Pollock, you can make it look like whatever you want, people will buy it. I make it how I want, it sits on my shelf at home. But each piece becomes unique hand-formed, individually decorated. Again, God is working on each of us differently. He's not making us all to be the same, which is good. But these are, this is where as you grow and learn and move, you learn where you should be. And God is using you in the position he's got for you. Just as the clay surrenders to the potter's hands, we need to surrender to Christ. Rest in God's capable hands. Let him make us into that vessel he would have us to be. We abandon our useless ways. We abandon our own strength. It's better this way. Let him, let his will shape us. Let him design us. Let God 
be the potters. We're safe in his hands. Again, through the process, day to day, until we are finished, until we return home to him, we are safe in his hands. I asked you at the beginning, or told you at the beginning, you should see what Gumby can do today. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's what we can do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you that you are the potter. We thank you for your strength, for your wisdom, for your love, and that your hands are always on us. You never take your hands off the clay, continually shaping us, molding us, breaking us down if need be, but building us right back up again. So, Father, we thank you for that, for your everlasting love, and that there is no thing in this world greater than you that could ever surpass you. We thank you and pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.